we are good to start good afternoon welcome to this magical monday and we have a magical person today at bw dialogue we have a person who has a midas touch uh, he's built uh, ebix into a global corporation and uh, while covid in the last 90 days has ravaged business and economy and of course lives uh, he's kind he's tried to reimagine this company today we have a very special guest in mr robin raina who is the ceo of ebix globally and also the chairman of ebix in india welcome mr robin raina to this bw dialogue thank you uh, robin the last 90 days have been very tough on people uh how have they been for you and what have you been doing well look, the last 90 days or even more than that have been uh, beginning march 1 actually have been pretty tough on everybody across the world so we're not immune from it um look meaning it's it's given that what it has done um it's created uh, the biggest uh, hunger it's created bigger issues than just economic issues today what it has done it's created hunger issues across the world and we are every human being is having to start it's having to think about uh, their own lives in terms of how to fend for themselves and so on and the future is a little bit uncertain today in people's mind uh in in the last 90 days or more 120 days i would say uh, ebix has had to face uh, issues of understanding and should we reinvent ourselves so to me uh you know there's always a positive side to everything and to me the positive side to covid is that covid has made companies rethink their strategies companies are starting to rethink how do they keep themselves lean mean and profitable if you step back before covid there were a lot of companies burning cash in the name of uh in the name of organic growth they were subsidizing their sales in india we know of tons of names companies who were being valued in billions and their simple strategy was that we will just give away uh products and subsidize our customer that's that isn't working anymore and when covid happened it was like a rude call to them a wake up call to them to say look this can't is can't go on forever their investors started getting in trouble and as back as back end investors start getting in trouble they go back to the companies and they say look we want you to we want you to stand up on your own and fend for your own and have a, have at least a business model where selling price is more than the cost price so what it has done it has leveled the ground post covid one of the good things that will emerge out of covid is that every company will have to fend for itself in the sense that companies who were getting away by subsidizing customers and then trying to gain revenue over their competitor aren't going to be able to do that so it has kind of leveled the ground it has also made companies aware that we need to be leaner we need to carry only as many employees as we need so it is it's one of those things so i always say that when the going gets tough the tough get going right so ebix in a way has has it's a testing time and i believe in a testing time a company which who can still keep their head high a company who can still produce profitable revenue streams is worth it its weight in gold ebix if you look at our last quarter results that we announced after covid after march you know which had the impact on march we still had a fantastic quarter uh, we as i look back at april may and june we have had a few businesses get impacted travel and forex in india uh, have been impacted but at the same time if you look at our businesses across the world including india the remaining businesses we're doing fantastic we're doing as well as earlier and in fact what has happened is covid has made our customers aware more aware so ebix is in the business of technology ebix is in the business of removing paper away and when we today reach out to whether an insurance company whether a bank whether a fortune 500 client all of these are more keen to listen to us today 
because in COVID they are starting to realize how they need to have e-signatures, how they need to be, you know, mobile, how they need anytime, anywhere, any place technology. So all of that is, I believe, is going to help companies like us. So it is a continuous phase of reinvention that every company has had to do, and Evix is no different from that. Thank you, Robin, um, for being so real. Uh, Robin, uh, the COVID-19 has also thrown a debate on lies and livelihood. Now, I know that as a CEO of the Robin Reina Foundation, even much before COVID, you were help doing your bit to support uh, families at the bottom of the pyramid. Tell us, how have, what have you done in the last 90 days to address some of the issues that came out of COVID? Look, as I look at my own job personally, I believe I'm in the business of spreading happiness. Um, whether I do it through EBIX, that's at least my effort, uh, or whether you look at uh, the Robin Anna Foundation. Today, Robin Anna Foundation, uh, you know, we have been all, we have always focused on education as a primary means of helping the underprivileged. And towards that, we run schools all across India. We've been doing this since 2003, where we educate thousands of kids. We provide them breakfast, lunch, healthcare, uh, meals, and so on. As a part of that project, we also started building homes um, on legal land for slum dwellers of Delhi. So today we are in the process of building out 6,000 homes for the slum dwellers of Delhi in Bawana. This is the single largest private charity uh, initiative in terms of building homes. Uh, in any part of the world, uh, the only other initiative is from the Habitat Foundation uh, run by Jimmy Carter, which is a pretty large initiative. But again, if you look at uh, from an India perspective, we absolutely have focused since 2006. We've started building, continue to build homes. We've handed over 2,304 homes. Uh, when COVID happened, uh, again, for you know, uh, helping the underprivileged, is an ecosystem. You need to build an ecosystem. So on one side, you're trying to educate kids, but on the other side, you're trying to provide homes. And then COVID happened. So we went back to the grass uh, roots and we realized that right now we just need to provide uh, help in terms of groceries, you know, uh, atta and uh, oil and rice and those kind of things. So we, we ran few camps, in, especially in the slums of Bhavana, wherein we distributed those kind of things, uh, groceries, providing basically 15 to 30 days of groceries. But again, look, anything we do is, is relatively small when you look at the, the problem that we are uh, dealing with. But from a Robin and a Foundation perspective, you see, we, our role has been consistent. We don't just wake up during, uh, during a pandemic or during the time of a, uh, of a particular bad event. We want to be there for the underprivileged. So what we try and do, we try and educate kids at, this, at, the, at the level of whether it is a three-year-old kid or a two-year-old kid, or whether it is a 20-year-old kid. Today, the, the advantage of, today the successes of those, you know, which makes me so proud during COVID itself, one of my kids, for example, Anup Dingra. Anup Dingra is a blind kid out of uh, Blind Relief Association of Delhi, uh, where we've been, we've been sponsoring, we've been educating blind kids out of uh, Blind Relief Association, uh, which is near uh, Defense Colony fly, Flyover. So we've been educating every blind kid that comes out of school. We, we educate them through their masters, send them to good schools like St. Stephen's, in Hindu school, Ramjas, Delhi University, and so on. So one of those kids, um, you know, we've, we've educated hundreds of such kids. And every year we pick up every kid out of this school and take them through their education until they finish their masters. So one of these blind underprivileged kids, Anu Dingra during COVID called me and told me he just got promoted as branch manager of Bank of Alaba in Chandigarh. That's a completely blind kid uh, completely, uh, who was underprivileged and today is in a position to help others. And that's what he's doing. So these are the kind of things that make you proud. But look, COVID is a big event. And we have to do, each and every person has to do what they can do to help 
um, you know, the underprivileged around us. Um, but again, I, I prefer to just be consistent in our dealing with underprivileged in terms of consistently supporting them because support can't come in for a day or a month or a year. If you want to really make a change, then you need to consistently support a particular family through uh, almost through 10, 15 years so that their entire generation of that family can enjoy the benefits of that help and go and get educated and can pass on, you know, help to their, uh, to their next generation and so on. Thank you, Robin. You know, Robin, you, you always thought of ideas ahead of their time, you know. Uh, so India as a country needs reinvention. What are your inputs for India reinventing itself? Uh, what are your ideas for India to be a big economic power or gain the lost ground in these three months? As you said, it's an opportunity for individuals, for companies and for countries to be imagined. So what are your ideas for India? Sanurag, that's a great question. Look, this is an amazing time in a way. The entire world is falling apart in many ways, economically, right? In this, in the next one year or two years, there will be some countries that will stand apart who will basically step up. And I'm hoping that India is one of those countries. Look, meaning US is starting to reinvent itself. And I believe India can be the second country which can take a lead along with US in this. So what does India need to do? From my perspective, there, is, there are a number of clear opportunities. Uh, the first opportunity is uh, taking a lead in manufacturing. The entire world is sick of China today. You see, it's not, it's not a secret. It's not only India that is sick of uh, China. Uh, U.S. people don't want to use Chinese goods. It's a, there's a complete economic war going on between India, uh, between U.S. and China. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a. All U.S. companies, if they had a choice, would want to move out of China. But Indian government needs to do something different. So we will need to come up with a, a clear manufacturing policy wherein. We will need to attract the large manufacturers from across the world in India. And how do we attract them? How do we make them move from China? A number of things we will need to do. One, we will need to ensure, we will need to give them some tax stops. We will need to say to companies like that, look, if you're going to set up base in India, depending on the amount of uh, employment, depending on the amount of employment you create, we will give you tax subsidies for example, I am of the opinion that government of India needs to give five to seven year tax holidays to any to, uh, to MNCs coming into India who set up manufacturing base and create employment of 2000 or more people. That should be the threshold level. Having said that, that's a, to me step number one, but that's not enough. Step number two, our labor policies will need to become better. While I understand that it is important to protect our labor and we have union policies, but it doesn't work. China has a lead in such things. Companies, when they come in, they want the, they want the ability to hire and fire. You can't ask a manufacturer and force a manufacturer that, look, we want you to not fire anybody. Then they're not going to come to India. So we need to create a level playing ground by at least having policies that match what China has or what Singapore has today. So if we are able to do these two things, three, we need to earmark land. And some of it government of India has already done. We need to find land in the right places. And we need to give, we, we need to provide that land to these guys at whatever prices you want to sell them at, but provide them at some decent standardized prices so that they can purchase it from the government of India with the, with the government backing provide them the tax off, provide them the, the ability uh, in terms of better labor laws. I think manufacturing world will gravitate towards India. At this time, there is a very large opportunity in that sector. The second thing that I would encourage is intellectual property right generation. If you look back at the last 30 years of India, one of the weaknesses that India has had is we haven't really created a lot of intellectual property. It's, 
I can count on my fingertips the companies who have created something that is now known across the world, whether it is Mahindra tractors, whether it is uh, Honda, uh, sorry, yeah. Hero, Hero motorcycles, Hero, or, uh, or whether there's Bajaj, absolutely. So there's three or four or five, but it hasn't take the software field. How many Indian software companies have created intellectual property, which is world leading or which is, which is being sold across the world? Our companies, the large ones, even the Wipros, the great companies, incidentally, you know, Infosys, Wipros, HCL, but all of these companies are in the mercenary business. We are, they are in project business. They're not really creating world leading IP. They're not creating the next Oracle. They're not creating the next Microsoft. So what government of India needs to do, government of India needs to encourage IP creation. And one of my suggestions to, uh, to the government has been that, look, what you need to do is you need to say companies who are investing in IP generation and are, and are now selling those products abroad, give them some subsidy. For example, if, if a company creates a new IP, tell them that your cost associated with that IP will be, you will get 200% weightage in terms of expenses for tax deduction. Now, countries like Canada allow you that. Countries like Singapore, when they are attracting outside companies to come into there and build IP in Singapore, give you that kind of thing, allowance to, you know, twice expense out an expense associated with an IP. So what that does is, it will reduce the taxation of those companies and it will encourage IP creation in India. And if you can create IP in India, look, then India is gold. This is an opportunity today. If, for example, we want to get rid of Chinese goods, there's a lot of stuff coming from China that doesn't need to come to India from China. And we are at war basically with China at this time. Why not use Indian goods manufactured in India and generate a, a, better, a better economy, make a, in, in the process, make a better economy. So I feel these two, these two or three things that I suggested are very key for India to reinvent itself. And, and the last thing I wanted to say about the infrastructure, when an economy is hurting, when employment is an issue, one of the ways to restart the economy is Government should take the time and put money back into infrastructure, building of roads, building of, because as you do all these labor intensive things, you're going to generate a lot of, you're going to bring a lot of these, uh, you know, migrant labor laborers into working in on infrastructure projects. If you can, in the process, you can not only improve India's infrastructure, but you're also helping people generate the employment at the at the lowest level and that impact in a trickle up manner will help the people who are in better position the manufacturers companies coming to india would want to see better infrastructure and so on so i feel these are certain key things that india needs to invest in fantastic robin since you work uh, as a ceo of ebix globally and you know you have a bird's eye view of what's happening in various sectors in various countries and how they are looking at India and China, what you said uh, is, is could be the playbook for the Indian government to be able to gain that advantage over China. Now, coming to EBIX, over the last five years, was very active in India. It made acquisitions. Uh, it partnered with entrepreneurs. Uh, will we see in future Robin Ryan and EBIX making more acquisitions? If yes, in what sectors? And if there are some immediate acquisitions, why don't you share it with our viewers and readers? Look, uh, uh, meaning we are going to be acquisitive. Uh, in the last few years, if you look back at the last two and a half years, we've invested uh, close to a billion dollars into India. I'm a very patriotic Indian, uh, love my country. I, I carry a US passport, but as I always say, I carry an Indian passport here in my heart. Um, and towards that extent, when I do something in India in terms of uh, working and buying companies, I'm trying to play a role as a as a as an Indian who uh, who, to, who who's gotten so much from my country where I was born. Uh, we are today also acquisitive. We're going to be acquisitive. Recently, we we just uh, 
uh, we just finished the acquisition of a company called Trimax. Uh, Trimax is a bus exchange company. We bought it through the NCLT route. Uh, it's a company that, uh, that provides uh, hardware and firmware in uh, buses, in thousands of buses in 18 different states today. Uh, that makes us a dominating player in the bus exchange sector, which means that you can walk in into, for example, a Maharashtra roadways bus or a Rajasthan roadways bus, for example, wave a smart card and pay for your ticket. And when you do that, you're going to be using EVIX technology in many of these states. Uh, we see that as a very big area of growth for us. Uh, we are presently negotiating deals, uh, which you know, add up to close to $75 million today, just in the bus exchange arena. We are in advanced stages of many of these deals. Uh, in addition to that, look, we, we are, uh, we are going to continue, we go, we will continue to be acquisitive. I couldn't tell you which company we are targeting simply because of the public company. Sectors. I'm governed. Uh, I could sectors. walk through sectors. Yes, it will be technology sectors. We are very focused today in India we would like to take a much bigger place in the in the uh, in the technology sector uh, first in the financial technology sector i mean and the insurance technology sector the second area where we intend to take more space is the travel sector uh, we believe that we have everything to lead the markets in the travel sector we are an end to end travel player right today we have the largest portfolio of travel products all the way from airlines to buses to trains, but, and we also provide hardware and firmware in buses. Uh, we provide charter flights and so on. We're the leaders in uh, events travel and so on. But then we, if you look back at it, we are also the technology behind almost most of our competitors. In the corporate travel sector, most of our competitors and are using our technology. So we kind of feel that we are India's true end-to-end -end travel player. We want to take our travel business, um, EBIX Cash travel business, uh, globally. And towards that extent, uh, you're going to see us make acquisitions both uh, in India and abroad uh, in the travel sector. Uh, so I think those are, uh, so technology is going to be absolutely a core area for us in terms of uh, acquisition and then, of course, uh, travel. You know, you talk about two sectors that are, have been in some way impacted. You talk about travel sector, you know, which has no fault of its own, has gone down to almost zero or zero level in some businesses, right? Now, how do you think travel tech can be a multiplier or bring back uh, demand and be able to build profitable businesses. Give us an example of that. Look, I think first thing, uh, it's how to be profitable in travel. I think let's start at the basics. I always say uh, it would be nice if people started realizing that selling price needs to be more than the cost price. <laughs> it's however it's hilarious. Like it. It's, Shouldn't have been. It's like... like <laughs> However hilarious it sounds, a lot of people don't understand that basic. They feel if the if they can if the selling price can be more, it can be less than the cost price, then they can sell a lot more. And then they magically think that at some stage when they've sold a lot, suddenly overnight they will increase prices, and now every customer will still stay with them, and they will become the leader. Now that's absurd, right? So I feel that a good start is go down to the basics, start doing business the way it should be done. Secondly, technology has to play a key role. Today, you it's not a choice. You need to build end-to-end -end travel products. You need to, um, technology needs to be in the center of all of this. And today what EBIX has done, you see, we made a number of travel acquisitions. I'm very patient with these acquisitions so we kept these companies alive on paper simply because of the ITA licenses they had and so on. But then today, what we have done, we've integrated all these companies under one brand. We brought all those companies, whether it was a Mercury, whether it was a Ledger, whether it was a Via, whether it is Pearl, whether it is Lawson, we bought all these so-called 
leaders in particular sectors, we brought them together, created today in EVIX Cash Travels, under one managing director, Naveen Kundu, gave him the empowerment and told him, we're going to back you. But when we back you, it should be everything. Put one single technology in the midst of it. So we put one single technology in the midst of it, integrated the sales teams, integrated the operational teams, are integrating the procurement teams. And then you put, as you put singular technology in the middle, then you bring all your products together. Whether it is your franchisee channel, whether it is your B2B channel, whether it is your B2C channel, whether it is your events travel, whether it is your charter flights or buses or trains or cabs or anything for that matter. We believe travel has to be cohesive. And from that perspective, in a way, COVID has been also a time where companies like us have taken the time to reinvent ourselves, to continually look back at what are the things we were doing right in the last two years. So we realized that we started to relook look back at the last two years of travel. We realized we've done phenomenally in terms of revenue growth, in terms of organic revenue growth. We did, we did marvelously well. We also realized that we've done way better than anybody in terms of, in term, amongst the leaders, amongst the so-called two, three leaders, we have done the best in terms of profitability because most of them don't make money. So we realized what we needed to do better is integrate even more tightly. We needed to put earlier, we were into the model of creating multiple managing directors with a focus on one uh, person's focus being on B2B, another person's focus being on B2C. And today we feel that model doesn't work. Today, you need to be smarter, leaner, more cohesive, and you need to put it all under one person, under one hierarchy under one technology, one cent common centralized processes and so on. And that's what we have done. So we are very bullish today about travel. We genuinely feel, look, it's a present moment is obviously terrible. Everybody looks at travel and says, well, am I, what's going to happen in the industry? I think part of it is international travel hasn't started and it has impacted everything. It's not just travel, it's impacted the logistics industry, transport industry, you know, you name it, it's, Airline it's impacted industry, every hotels. hotels, shipping, meaning even groceries, your price of stuff has gone up because ship, shipping isn't happening in time and so on. So having said all that, look, travel is not going to stop. You and me are not going to still sit at one place, meaning unless the world falls apart, I don't think everybody wants to travel. More than ever, people are starting to think about the last holiday they had the last business trip they had, and everybody is rearing to get out. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. But at that point, companies need to be ready. Companies who are going to be ready with a simplistic, cohesive business model, I think are going to succeed. And we feel we have a very global, cohesive travel model. And we are very bullish about it. Thank you, Robin, for giving that hope and the way forward on you know, travel tech. Uh, I want to talk to you about, you worked in, you know, EBS is headquartered in Atlanta, you worked in the US, uh, you've taken a small, mid-sized technology company to a very large scale. Tell us what is it about Indians uh, that makes them competitive across the globe and uh, gets them to be winners? And what's special about Indian entrepreneurship in India? Look, uh, uh, Indians have one thing, uh, uh, which is, I feel that keeps us, um, makes us better than others. Uh, we, innate Indians are, people don't realize that, that people who are working in, in the, uh, in management roles, or even in the middle management level, or at lower management level, Indians on an average are more educated than people in any part of the world. Take US for that matter. The average salary in US is 15 to $18,000, right? But then if you, a year, if you look back at those, the profile of those people, you're not going to find many graduates. In India, you go at the lowest denominator today in a government office or in a private office, and you're going to find a 
the junior most guy is at least a graduate right so education in india wherever they've been educated whether they've been educated in hindi medium or punjabi medium or english medium it doesn't matter people are more educated that actually helps us a lot secondly indians tend to be more analytical i don't know what why is that so but i will tell you i would say that it starts at the you know at the in the uh, at the aryan stages indians were always the pundits you know even in the in the archaic phases or uh, you know uh, in the aryan phases the indians were more educated more uh, you know cerebral in their mind today indians are more analytical right? in india for example when i was studying in uh, i did my engineering at thapar's uh, in patiala thapar institute engineering and technology we weren't allowed to use a calculator till the fourth year of my engineering so we had no choice we would go into an exam and we had to add numbers up immediately in our mind right or on a piece of paper whereas abroad people are using calculators virtually when seventh or eighth you know people are in fifth or sixth grade and they are already starting to use calculator so the time to become you know there are certain things that are forced in the indian system which look terrible in the beginning but ultimately make us more cerebral more analytical we also deal with more life situations every day you see when you go to a meet an indian doctor in aims or in saftarjan that indian doctor has to make 250 decisions in the 8 hours very very quickly he he or she doesn't have time he's got to make that decision quickly in us a doctor in that 8 time 8 hour period is probably going to make 10 decisions or 12 decisions why because he's going to be very he's going to be worried about liability that doctor is he's dealing with much lesser number of patients and accordingly will go in a very methodical manner whereas in india pressure because the pressure is so high on the system where in so many people land up in that hospital that doctor has to make decisions rationally and quickly and in the process with all this stress when it comes into a system it makes us just stronger it makes indians more prepared to handle difficult situations we god has given us a country where there is extreme heat at times extreme rain we we are we are you know we are used our body is 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 ready for you know more hardship uh, more disease oriented and we still have to earn our livelihood and succeed so when an indian then moves on and goes abroad that same indian finds so much a comfort around him or her that life becomes so much easier and when he or she takes the same amount of hard work and puts that in that western society he's actually functioning at 300% better at a higher level than the next american out there meaning and again this is may or may not uh, some people might find it discriminatory but this is the truth this is indians because of the situation that is created around us indian kids at the 7th grade level a, an indian kid studying in the 7th class and you compare it to an, the same indian kid, you know uh, to the same parent who has another kid 7th grade in 7th grade let's say in the us and i'll tell you the kid in india at the 7th grade level will be more analytical will have more understanding of uh, of how to find solutions simply because the pressure on the system is so high the competitiveness is so high and that by itself makes us better prepared so indians are always going to be that's why one of the reasons why i look at covid and i say if there is one society that is best prepared to handle covid and come out of it still smiling and maybe at the top that's india so to me that's the basics of you know this is one of the reason we are a little bit there was a book written a long time back in the us called jugaad and it actually meant jugaad of india it was in taught in management schools how indians tend to be finding solution now i wasn't so frugal. pleased when i, I call fru- jugaad frugal innovation <laughs> correct i wasn't one of those who was very pleased reading that book because i felt it kind of undervalued in the ball on one side it said certain things which were a fact but on the other side i also feel indians have gotten beyond jugaad now 
Indians don't only want to be producing jugad. Indians want to produce the best thing in the world now. That's the feeling. We don't want to be, be a, an also ran in the world. And I feel that makes us better prepared with the overall the way we have been brought up. I feel we're better prepared to handle hardship. And that puts us always ahead of others. Thank you, Robin. I hope what you say happens, we end up being happy and come out stronger and hopefully with less communities and, you know, our livelihoods are intact. Uh, at this point, I want to ask you that, you know, all founders, all CEOs, irrespective of the size of the company, have had to downsize their costs in every business, whether it's India's largest corporations, mid-sized firms, startups. What have you done at Ebix in terms of your cost? Have you had to let go people? And how tough it was if you had let go people? Uh, and my second question is, when you acquire companies, what are the top three, four things you look at uh, when you acquire the company and how important is the culture of the company? How important is the orientation of the founder? So look, uh, let me take that in reverse order. First of all, they're two totally different questions. So uh, from an acquisition perspective, when we acquire companies, uh, we um, tend to reinvent them completely. It's a little bit of a root shock for them. However well they've been built up, we try to, uh, we try to streamline them. We try to centralize a lot of services. On day one, we centralize HR, marketing, finance, development, IT, and product creation. And we leave mostly their sales and marketing setup uh, separate for the time being in a decentralized manner. And gradually over the period of next one or two years, we integrate their sales and marketing, uh, sales functions also. Uh, from an IP uh, perspective, if they, if, if the acquired company had created, has created any IP without fail in two years, we tend to rebuild that IP. That's been our track record. And part of the reason we do that, it makes we work, Evix has operated in the past and continually has operated at reasonably high operating margin levels, at reasonably high profitability levels. We're not embarrassed about it, that we have, we've been pro consistently profitable for the last 21 years and have, are very proud of it actually, that we've been on, uh, Fortune's 100 fastest growing company list five times in the last 10 years. Uh, that's a rare honor uh, that virtually not any Indian company, but on, around the world, that's a rare honor to have. Uh, so we feel our consistency, we don't take our consistency for granted. So when we acquire companies, we look at the founder, we look for, we look if the, if the acquired company has a founder who brings, we expect integrity, we expect transparency from those founders, but then they have to really fit in very quickly into EBIC style of centralized thinking. And sometimes when they don't, we then make changes. It's that simple. Our goal is not to uh, get rid of every founder. We actually try to retain, and for majority of the time, we have retained all our founders. Um, having said that, um, you know, acquisition is a science by itself. You have to be very analytical. You have to be very focused. And you have to have a very clear vision and you have to be ready to take hard steps to implement that vision. If there is a pain in taking hard steps on day one, take that pain. That's what Evix does. I like the band-aid approach. Just take the pain, remove the band-aid in one go and feel the pain, but get done with it. So that's the acquisition side. Now, your second question was related to uh, whether we had to let people go and and how, uh, what have we done? So look, from an EBIT perspective, uh, we uh, take this, uh, our single biggest strength is our employee force. Uh, we have 7,000 plus employees in India alone today. And then worldwide, obviously we have a very large number. We operate, we have customers in, you know, 69 countries that we have clients in and we, we operate virtually across five continents today. And, and why, how are we able to provide the quality of service that we provide or generate the kind of profitability we generate is because of our employees. So we uh, look at our employees as the single biggest asset we have. Now, 
it's been a hard time. I can't uh, tell you that it's been an easy time. Our main area where we got impacted in terms of uh, employees was travel and foreign exchange. We made every effort not to let people go. We had to put certain people on furloughs or on uh, slight uh, cuts in India in the area of travel and, and foreign exchange. At the same time, our attempt is, our goal is, our clear vision is, we want to bring each and every employee back. Each and every employee in travel and forex, we would like them to be back. We're waiting for international travel to open. As international travel opens, you know, and India starts uh, recovering its uh, uh, strength back in the area of travel and foreign exchange, our intent is to bring back everybody. Other than that, it's a very minimally impacted our employee force across the world. Uh, we have uh, been as solid as ever uh, in terms of our employee force. But again, even in, even in the area of travel and foreign exchange, uh, you know, we, we are, uh, we, I wouldn't say that we have been keen on letting people go or we have made a lot of changes. Uh, we are one of those companies who felt that we needed to take certain short-term steps in these two areas. We took those, but the goal of those short-term steps was to retain almost every employee. Our goal was not to take the easy route of letting people go. We want to protect their employment, but sometimes to protect that employment, you have to put certain people on furlough for a certain period of time. And that's what we did, uh, but it, it isn't a long-term uh, furlough that we are putting people on. Sure. And travel sector, we can understand all other players have also cut uh, workforce. They've sent people, all the players in this segment. So I don't think you're alone in doing that. So, you know, uh, Robin, I, I, I want to be very real with you since I know you. And you, you know, a lot of people are very jealous of your success, EBIC success. There is a constant uh, attempt to be kind of put EBICs down. What do you have to say to your critics? Uh, you know, uh, and for example, you were doing this acquisition that you haven't done. I have seen that you're very business-like and you have the ability to walk away from decisions when they're not right for your company. They may not be the most popular decision. Uh, so what do you have to say? Tell us why did you walk away from a certain acquisition uh, broadly? And second, what do you have to say to your, uh, you know, there are people who are very jealous of EVIC's growth and success and the future prospects that it holds. What do you have to say to them? Look, Ming, um, first thing, as uh, an EBIC CEO, I've been chairman of the EBIC board worldwide for, uh, this is my 21st year uh, as chairman of the board. And uh, my first responsibility is capital allocation. Uh, I see my role as a capital allocator. I need to make sane decisions. They need not be popular decisions. Uh, any man any manager needs to first need to first needs to learn how to live with unpopularity you see popularity can be can be had by making bad decisions it is it is more you ultimately will become popular if you do make the consistent decisions over a period of time and you're trying to help people genuinely from your heart so from my perspective, one of the strengths that I have had and EBICS has had, you can go across the world in any part of the world, whether it is Singapore or New Zealand or Australia or London or US or India, you're going to find for the last two decades, people who joined us at that time are still there. The top level people in all these places are still there. You can go down to employee number one in India, employee number two in India, or or employee number three in India who joined in the year 2001 are still there in EVIC. So we must have done something right. Now, having said that, as a businessman and as a capital allocator and as a CEO of a publicly traded company, you can't bring your ego in the midst of it. You can't get too attached to an idea. You need to look at realities of where you are, what is in the interest of your company, what is in the interest of your shareholders, and then accordingly make a sane decision. In the process, you try to ensure that you don't hurt any of your employees. And you, I genuinely try not even to hurt people, other companies that I am working with. But sometimes that's the nature of the business. When you make hard decisions, the other side may or may not like that decision. 
So you have to be prepared to take the pain of that so-called unpopularity. From my perspective, look, I am in pu public life. I've been in public life for the last two decades. Virtually, I mean, as a, whether I talk about my business, whether I talk about my charity, whether I talk about any other interests I have, I've been in public life. And when you are in public life, people have the right to call you names. There are people who will say amazing things about you. So I'm blessed I have 2 million plus fans, for example, on my social media pages. At the same time, you will have people who may not like your style of thinking. You today could be at any level, whether you are Mr. Modi as Prime Minister of India, or whether you are President Obama, or whether you are Bush, or whether you are President Trump. One guy calls you a genius, and another person calls you an absolute idiot. People go talk in such extremes about presidents of America and prime ministers of India, which is honestly embarrassing almost. But at the end of the day, you, when you are in public life, you have to learn to live with it. You can't get it, you can't let it go under your skin. You need to from within know, are you making a decision with your heart into it? Did you make a, a decision that you believe is in the best interest of all the parties involved? And if the answer is yes, you go with that decision and you stick to that decision. So from my perspective, um, look, I, I don't know whether people are jealous of me or my company. I, I honestly know one thing. Uh, I am in the business of spreading happiness. I am here, I am here not to, I don't feel happy about killing any competition of mine. I just want to grow even. I just want to create more employment. I just would like to spread a lot of happiness through my work. I'm not going to live forever. I realize that. So today, the time that I have, whether it is 20 years or 30 years or 10 years or five years, I want to be happy and I want to spread a lot of happiness. And in the process, if people feel good about it, that would be fantastic. But if they don't, I'll have to take that pain and, and just try and do the right thing each and every time. At least that's, that's my effort. And if I make mistakes from time to time, look, I'm, I'm human. I am not perfect at what I do. Uh, at the same time, I do it with, with all the right thought processes for people involved, for businesses involved, especially for the underprivileged. I, it, I, I just can't cause pain. It's a very big part of my life to try and uh, have happy people around me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Robin, uh, uh, for being so real and taking such questions and you know head on and addressing them. And since I know you, I believe you, uh, I've seen you in action. So I know there is complete sync in what you're saying and what you do. Uh, I just want to ask, this year we were looking forward to the EBIX IPO, right? Clearly, uh, this year is not a good time for any IPO, uh, right? Uh, and Absolutely. now Geo has raised more than a lack of crores. Our last cover was on the Geo mm -hmm. uh, being unlocked by Mr. Mukesh Ambani. What do you think this unlocking means for India. So if Mr. Mukesh Amani is able to raise one lakh crores for an Indian company at almost a six lakh crore valuation, uh, it possibly means a faith in India, in the Indian consumer. So what do you think is the impact of geo on an economy? And uh, when do you think will the EBIX IPO come out? Look, meaning, first of all, e e EBIX IPO is not going to happen this year because it doesn't make any sense, as you rightly said. So next year is what we are planning for an IPO. Hopefully, uh, you know, we'll see. Presently, we're targeting April or May, but it all depends, frankly, on how the Indian markets come back, how India comes back. I'm one of those who believes we'll see a V-shaped recovery in the fourth quarter. I believe beginning November, we're going to start seeing exponential growth coming out of India. India is going to be back, is what I believe. So going back to what you talked about, Geo, look, Geo is Geo. It's backed by Mr. Mukesh Ambani. He's proven himself. He's done a phenomenal job at proving himself. Geo has brought India onto the, onto the world map and uh, full marks to Mr. Mukesh Ambani for what he's done uh, to stand up against the Jeff Bezos and uh, the Bill Gates and prove and stand on his own feet is, is a remarkable achievement. I, I gave him 300% marks for doing what he's done. 
Uh, and clearly, it's going to help India. At the same time, I wouldn't read too much into, does it mean that Geo IPO and uh, Geo has been able to raise money, so every company will be able to raise money? I'm not so sure. It is, uh, Geo is a Geo. It's a much bigger outfit, much bigger backing, backed company. Uh, today, I do believe, however, the entire world is focused on the Indian consumer because that's where the businesses are, that's where the markets can be. So that's going to be a good market. So Indian uh, IPOs, I believe, are going to finally do well. Uh, this is not a good time, obviously, uh, because of COVID. Uh, India has been very badly impacted by COVID. It's been, economy has been, uh, you know, has been very dramatically hurt in India uh, for all the reasons that you and me talked about. I feel that as we start going into a V-shaped recovery, Indian IPOs are going to be back. They're going to be as good as they used to be or better. And uh, what Geo has done will then help them. But we need to get our markets to improve. We need to get the Indian basic infrastructure, basic uh, core sectors to improve. Uh, I, I believe beginning fourth quarter, we're going to start seeing some of that change. And then uh, ultimately, uh, it will help. Look, from our perspective, we were uh, thinking of uh, an IPO, which we were working with three of India's top banks, uh, investment bank. Um, who had valued it somewhere in the range of three to five billion dollars, this particular IPO. But we realized that, look, there's no point of even talking about it right now until COVID passes, until Indian markets are back. So we're going to make that decision more towards the end of the year or more towards the beginning of next year when we want to launch the EBIX Cash IPO um, next year. Thank you. My last question before I take some audience questions is, you know, what are your pieces of advice or pearls of wisdom for Indian entrepreneurs who are dealing with, not everyone has the scale and size and the tenacity like you, but who are dealing with loss of revenue, uh, they've not been able to raise capital. What do you have to say to them? Uh, what should they do? What is your message to them? Look, I, I, I first of all, I empathize with them. I've been there. Uh, if I take if I go back uh, 20 years back, when I joined EBEX, uh, EBEX, if you look at the revenue of EBEX and the losses, EBEX had $19 million in losses that year in 1999. And EBEX had made uh, $11 million in revenue that year. So I, I firsthand can tell you, I dealt with it. And the company was, had completely run out of cash. And I will tell you, so from that learning itself, I can try and guide uh, people, entrepreneurs, and try and tell them what I did. It went, you have to go back to the base. Not, nothing is a substitute for hard work, but the most important thing you need to have, you need to have a clear business model. Please, for God's sake, don't get caught up, too caught up in strategic thinking. When you're building your business, Please ensure that your selling price is a lot more than the cost price. I keep emphasizing it because people somehow miss this. They somehow feel if we build up a loss-making business, but we make it a big business, finally it will become a great business. No, it doesn't work that way. In recent times, you've seen a lot of companies crash and, and market caps go, go away in thin air. So you can't just think that you're becoming bigger and so on and, and take losses. So go back to the basics. You will also don't overstretch yourself. Don't start, if you can, if you're only able to raise, if you're only able to raise two crore rupees in financing, then please try to build your business around two crores. Don't try to overthink yourself and try to build a business around 10 crores and keep thinking in your mind, because I always say it is, then you might as well go to Vegas and start playing blackjack. It is better, you might win more money that way. Because don't gamble with your business. Focus on your business and only spend as much as you can afford. And also look back at whatever you have built in now. Make sure you protect it. When you take a jump, when you take a leap, Let's say you get the next big opportunity, a next big growth opportunity, next big order, or a next big acquisition comes in. The first thing you need to think through is, what if that acquisition, what if that new 
big order that you are thinking of go south does not work out well ultimately will it destroy your existing business if the answer to that question comes out as yes it has the ability to completely destroy what my what i have built till now then please don't take that decision my suggestion is protect what you have take that as a foundation then go on build on top of it don't overdo things try to walk on your own legs don't try to walk on somebody else's legs don't use crutches in your business right it goes back to the basics of that today is a very hard time wherein raising money is hard in spite of government's efforts to tell banks to loan more money banks are going the opposite way banks are aren't loaning more money to they are they are being more difficult with with entrepreneurs so it's a very hard time i can't discount that time but i also feel that this time will pass everything passes people need to make sure that don't take big jumps in this time in this time the covid time go through december and ensure that you're standing on your own feet whatever if you have to make changes to make your business lean and make unpopular decisions please make those unpopular decisions because ultimately you will provide more employment and protect more jobs if you make those unpopular decisions today because it is important that when covid finishes by the time covid finishes you should be standing your business should be standing and because then you'll be better prepared for growth otherwise if you have hurt yourself already in the process then even a good time is not going to help you so those those are some of my thoughts beautiful as an entrepreneur i can relate to some of the things you say i hope and i'm sure other entrepreneurs do uh, i have my colleague who are possibly our best writers or among our best writers he has covered auto for us but uh, you try to compete with mr raina you're wearing a right red t-shirt oh, abhishek oh, oh, there about eight nine no, no. from the audience will take those but abhishek your question for mr raina yeah yeah thank you yeah so very honor to speak to you so i have a couple of questions so so of late uh, am i audible so yes yeah okay of late the government is framing a lot of rules and regulations on covid insurance and you are also present in the insurance sector do you intend to leverage on this trend on covid insurance which is happening big time in india and also happening elsewhere that's my first question second question uh, donald trump has recently clamped down on h1b visas uh, uh, is it going to negatively impact uh, uh, do you support that move if yes why if no why and what should have been done instead of this i mean your thoughts i think the uh... the first question was related to covid uh, yeah, so let me address that covid, COVID insurance. insurance yeah so covid insurance look we have a joint venture uh, in insurance with bsc it's called bsc evex wherein we have uh, wherein we sell insurance across the country so covid insurance is also one of our product at the same time let me share with you my genuine opinion it is it is just uh, it is a it's not a long term product from my perspective when you have events like covid i am one of those who believes that covid finally will go away so it is not like term life it's not like your auto insurance and home insurance which you need irrespective of time covid is going to be there it looks like the most important thing right now it's like in a flood right flood insurance in a in at a particular time even in a city like delhi sounds very good if there was a flood but now but then for next 50 years there may not be any flood insurance need so covid is one of those things which is a specialized kind of insurance which seems to have value today but i am not sure if this is a consistent does is it a consistent value provider over the period of next 4 or 5 years simply because my belief is a vaccine will come and a covid is going to be fixed so it's one is just another product that we also have Uh, like other companies, but I wouldn't pay too much attention to it. It's a it's a good thing to carry COVID insurance today if you can buy it at the right price. Uh, there's no harm in it. But at the same time, whether it will be useful 2021 or 22, uh, I doubt it. And I hope I I am right on this one. Right. Your second question was regarding President Trump and his clampdown on H1Bs. Yeah. Look, I can't support it. 
I absolutely feel, uh, I can't support it as an American, I can't support it as an Indian, uh, either way, uh, simply because it is, in my mind, as a regressive step. It's, a, it's not the, uh, on one side, let me share with you, I'm one of those who, uh, who uh, believes Mr. Trump is India's true friend. If I, if I had to look back at the can two candidates today, uh, you know, one candidate is questioning uh, India's, uh, India's basic policies in Kashmir and uh, Mr. Biden. And on the other side, you have Mr. Trump, who's backed India through and through. So I, 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 uh, I give, I, I feel uh, I'm very supportive of Mr. Trump uh, to that extent as when I wear my Indian hat out there. But then when you look at H-1Bs, look, even from a U.S. perspective, it isn't good. To think that it will create more, it will help local, uh, locals generate more employment isn't really true. H-1Bs were created because this was in specialized sectors. There, are, there is a lack of availability of people. There has never been that much availability. So specialized manpower was required. If we go in, let's say, in city of Chicago and I start looking for people in a particular technology skill area, and I only search locally, I can tell you either I won't find, people won't be available or I have to steal them from the next player by paying a prohibitive price. When I steal somebody from another competitor, let's say, at the end of the day, I haven't really helped the economy. I haven't created, you know, it, it, hasn't, it hasn't really helped. You want US businesses to be more profitable also. That's what Mr. Trump wants ultimately. He's been saying that he wants U.S. businesses to be better, stronger, more profitable. So I don't feel this step helps in that direction. It, it contradicts what he's been trying to do in terms of growing business. He's done a very good job in certain respect. To, you know, pre-COVID, U.S. economy was doing extremely well. I feel some of these uh, are knee-jerk reactions. Uh, because we are in a political season right now, there's election time and uh, both sides are going to make decisions which may or may not uh, finally help, uh, you know, create more employment or more uh, business opportunities in the U.S. itself. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. We'll thank, take, thank you, Vishik, for those lovely questions, relevant questions. Uh, there, is, uh, there are many questions I'll take too. Uh, Sunil Shah is asking, given the rapid rise of Geo and the landscape set by UPI, uh, how has that influenced the big cash digital strategy? Second is, I'll take a question from Siddhant Kachru. Uh, thank you for this interaction, BW. Uh, this question is to Robin, sir. Please share your vision on the way the demand curve will be. The biggest question in everyone's mind is, you talked about V-shaped recovery, but do you think demand will come back? How do you think consumer spending will get affected as most of the companies will move from wants to needs, and so will be the consumers. Okay, so what, the first question I think was regarding uh, UPI and how does EBIT cash get impacted? Look, UPI is a very positive step. It's, a, it's an extremely positive step, and it is not a competition to EBIT cash. We don't compete with UPI in any way. It is uh, we will inter we would interface our products with UPI. Everybody has to do it. Everybody should do it. I would strongly encourage people to do that. It's a it's a very positive step taken by the government of India. And Evix Cash is one of those open architecture solutions that it works with everybody, right? And so uh, I don't see uh, that as a uh, as a competitive step to us, but a very uh, supplemental positive step in that. Uh, um, fashion. The other question I think was from Siddhant related to, uh, uh, to demand versus to the V-shaped recovery and the demand curve. Look, meaning in the short term, demand is going to be hit. There's no question about it that, uh, you know, when you, when people have less money in their pocket, uh, their demand is, demand is going to come down at the same time. And it will impact us for some time. Even as we come out of recovery, people are going to start you know, protecting their money, they will they will travel a little bit lesser than normal. Uh, but at the same time, when I talk about a V-shaped recovery, V-shaped recovery doesn't mean that if you were doing $100 of business last year, 
you're going to be doing $120 this, uh, in the month of November. That's not what I'm saying. I am actually saying your 100 has become right now zero in certain sectors or has become 30. Once your first step has to be in a V-shaped recovery has to be to go back to 60 to 80% of where you were. And I believe by November, we're going to get to that shape where we will be 70, 60, 80% of where we were. Not still at the same level. But by the time we get into next year, I believe we're going to see growth. We will see genuine growth. That same 100 is going to start becoming 110 or 107 or so on. And that is going to, this is, it's a cycle. There is going to be demand is, isn't, suddenly it's not like Indian consumer is going to go away or Indian consumers thought process is changing. Uh, everybody has, everybody wants to live a better lifestyle. And today what is happening is that we are having to curtail our, uh, our lifestyle simply because of the amount of money we have, the, you know, the job pressure and so on. As we go forward uh, in coming days, I think as more money comes in into the economy, both at, at, the, at the lowest level, which is very important at the lowest level, as also in terms of more manufacturing starting and so on, you are going to see the trickle down impact of it. It is going to bring back money into, uh, into uh, the market. And we are starting to see a lot of recovery already in many sectors. If I take, you know, I, I, we work in many sectors where we are already seeing the change that there is, there is a recovery of 60 to 70 percent already from where, uh, you know, as compared to where it was from zero, virtually from zero. And we are seeing now a 60 to 70 percent recovery already in the month of June. So there is a continuous, uh, you know, upheaval that is, go is happening and will continue to happen. Government of India announced a lot of steps, some of these steps that I believe on paper, they sounded like, to many of you, they sounded like lollipops, that there was no real money being shared. But in reality, Government of India did take long-term steps. I believe in the next six to eight months, you're gonna see the impact of some of those steps in the economy. I was one of those who, when Government of India took those steps, I was one of those who was saying that, look, you're not going to see these, in the short term, they look like, they're not gonna give you a quick impact. But in the long term, these steps will ultimately help build a better economy. So from my perspective, uh, we will see, uh, demand is going to be back. Demand is going to be back. We are going to see a V-shaped recovery. V-shaped recovery in 2020 and will have a slightly different meaning from what in, in 21 and 22. Uh, India is going to be at the forefront uh, of this fight of the, you know, the economic, India is the economic power. It is the power, it is here to stay. This is a COVID or no COVID, this power is not going to just uh, go evaporate overnight. India is absolutely going to be an, an economic powerhouse. Uh, it, COVID has hurt us for the, uh, India for the time being, but I think this country has the resilience to come back in a very big way and very soon. Thank you, Robin. There are many questions to Mr. Sunil Shah. You asked two questions. I've asked both, one in my own way and one as you put it out. So, you know, Ash Raina, uh, you asked this question on how you logged in from Australia and how we can be competitive is already answered. I think the only two questions that are left are, uh, you know, one is around that you've been a very fitness oriented person. Look at you, right? So we talk of immunity being boosted uh, in COVID, how, you know, we have to keep your immunity high. So how has fitness been important for you? And the second question was saying, some people consider you as a style icon. So, Tell us a bit about these two parts of your personality. Look, uh, COVID has been uh, a learning process for everybody, right? It, even from a fitness perspective, it has uh, been a learning process for me, meaning I have, I realized I had more time to work out. So one of the things I have done over the last few months is um, I spent close to two hours, two and a half hours every day on my workout side. So I, 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 I focus on uh, one, one and a half hours of complete workouts, taking 
one or two body parts and focusing on them and then going back to a different body part the next day and doing a proper workout uh, in my gym. I, I do a lot of bicycling. Um, I have one of those uh, uh, fast bicycles. So I try to, I try to drive, uh, I try to do bicycling for at least uh, 50 to 60 minutes a day, um, 15 to 20 kilometers a day that I try to bicycle. I personally feel that it is very important to be healthy. Uh, if you are not physically fit, if you don't personally feel fit, when you wake up in the morning, you need to feel light. You need to feel that you're looking forward to the day. Your legs have to be looking forward to the day. Your mind has to be looking forward to the day. And there has to be something new every day. And to me, those are important things. You're not becoming, nobody is becoming younger. Neither am I. I'm not becoming younger by the day. So to keep my mental energies alive, to keep my mental juices flowing, I need to be fit. And towards that extent, I do my best. I try to work hard and, uh, you know, the, as you get older, you have to work that much more harder to keep yourself fit. And I try to do that. And with respect to your question of style icon, I don't know about that. Look, it's a, it's a beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. I don't see myself as a style icon. I, I just try to be myself. Um, I don't have any goals of, uh, you know, I, all I try to do is I want to be, uh, when I, whatever I wear, whatever I do, I want to feel young in my mind. I want to feel young at my heart and I want to feel energetic. And sometimes that energy comes through in whatever makes you feel that energy. Look, I, I was in a meeting in, at Lloyd's uh, some time back and I walked in in jeans and, and met uh, the chief operating officer of Lloyd's. And the Lord CEO told me, nobody, it's very rare to see somebody wearing tone jeans and walking in into a meeting with a t-shirt in employed at that level. She, they, she wasn't being critical, but she just generally made a remark and I laughed and I said, look, part of why I wore these jeans to your office today is to tell you, um, you need change. London needs change. London market needs change. London insurance market needs change. Lloyd's needs to change. And change needs starts from every facet. It's not just wearing a black suit and a black tie and coming to office that makes you look and feel better. The world has evolved. London markets, if you want to be ahead of the world in insurance, you will need to make change. And I said, for me, what I try to do each and every day in how I behave, how I dress, I am an embodiment of change. I try to start from myself and I, I try to, uh, you know, we are ultimately, in India especially, we have a very young society. You know, 65% people uh, reaching the age of 35. Uh, I, it doesn't, I don't think if I can just wear suits and come in and boy, I think they will empathize a little bit lesser with me uh, versus when I sit with them in their way of dress up, their way of functioning, it's much easier to talk to them, much easier to have a dialogue with them, much easier to understand each other. And that's what I try to do in, uh, in, um, you know, in how I dress and, uh, or, uh, or all my actions from that perspective. Thank you, Robin. It's been fascinating talking to you. On a Monday afternoon also, we've had a fantastic audience. And I'm sure your journey and your suggestions for the future will help all our readers and viewers, we wish you luck and we look forward to talking to you soon again. Thank you and God bless you. That was Thank Robin Raina, Chairman and CEO of Ebix, uh, talking to you on entrepreneurship, on travel tech, on the way ahead for India and how India can use this advantage to possibly uh, get ahead of China or at least in some years be at the same level as China. Thank you. God bless you. We'll see you another time. Thank you, Rob.